Welcome, everyone. I uh, hope you're enjoying your South by Southwest EDU event. Uh, this is the Examining Our Faith in Educational Technology discussion uh, conversation. Uh, we're going to loop you all into it uh, because that's really the, the best way to, uh, to kind of share uh, great ideas and thoughts, and uh, that's what we're here to do today for the next hour or so. Um, my name is Hugh Norwood. I'm uh, the CEO of Trinity Education Group. Uh, and uh, have been around the educational technology space as a uh, uh, developer and, uh, and uh, business uh, owner for um, about 20 years uh, or so in uh, both higher education and K-12. Um, and I've got two rock stars here with me that I'm going to introduce to you in just a second. But I thought what I'd do is frame, uh, frame our conversation a little bit today uh, with, uh, and then let them uh, introduce themselves and then also introduce themselves in the context of that, uh, of that frame or that discussion, and then we'll kind of get going from there. Um, and this will be a little bit freewheeling. Um, I'll say up at the, at the start, we are going to try to do this Slido uh, question uh, uh, situation here. So if you have questions that you want to pose to us or that you'd like us to discuss or you'd like to discuss with us, please feel free to, uh, to enter them in. There's a... Um, I guess it's the South by Southwest EDU uh, um, designation for Slido. Um, we are, uh, yeah, we're at, um, uh, that's that, uh, 12 AB, so it, it should be pop, pop right up. Um, and, uh, and so let me, let me uh, describe how this, how this group came together a little bit. Uh, um, you know, we've, we've, we've all, we're all kind of veterans of, uh, of the education space, uh, and we have been looking at the, uh, the role that educational technology plays uh, writ largely as policy and then as practice uh, for a long time. And uh, um, one, of the, one of the questions, the central questions that we wanted to kind of wrestle with and bring forward into public discussion was this, uh, this kind of challenge of the, the promise of ed educational technology as well as the challenges or the um, the, the, the possible downsides of uh, educational technology and uh, its, its um, involvement or intrusion, depending upon how you, how you look at it, in the K-12 space. Uh, and we see things, uh, um, you know, technology is mediating more and more of our lives. Uh, we see things like one-to-one um, uh, um, -one initiatives and BYOD, online assessments, connected classrooms, teachers quantifying attendance, behavior, attitudes, as well as performance. Um, the, the, the new guard of Google, Khan, and Dreambox have, have uh, kind of become the same level of, uh, of buzzword and same level of impact as Pearson, McGraw-Hill, and HMH. And, uh, and we see this rise in uh, proliferation of applications, technology, software, hardware, uh, internet connected devices, and uh, opportunities for kids to connect and, and engage more freely than ever before. And meanwhile, at the same time, we see these kind of uh, uh, little wrinkles in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the future, right? Uh, we see, you know, rise in teenage depression and anxiety related to screen time, cyberbullying, identity theft, cheating, hacking, digital divides, socioeconomic, racial, linguistic, rural versus urban. Uh, and then in our population, at, at popular media, we see an era of diminished privacy, uh, political meddling, automation and outsourcing, information anxiety, fake news. All of these things are also uh, uh, um, attendant with uh, a rise in technology in our culture and in our schools. And so with that kind of frame of reference about the discussion and the, and the, the kind of uh, um, uh, focal point, um, I want to turn it over to, like I said, the two rock stars here on, on stage with me. Uh, Richard Collada and uh, Mary Ellen Elia, and I'll let them uh, introduce themselves a little bit, tell you a little bit about their background and you what brings first. them to this stage today. So, you want to start? Okay. Hi, everyone. How you doing? Good. Uh, I'm Richard Collada. I am the CEO of ISTE. I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Um, we also have two members of Team ISTE right here, Mindy and Alyssa, so if I say anything wrong, they're just going to throw stuff up at me, but that's okay. Uh, we're used to that. Um, my uh, background before uh, my current role, I actually started as a, a teacher. I was a high school Spanish teacher. Went on and did some work in teacher prep um, and then helped run some schools in Latin America for a while and had a chance um, to actually go out and help with policy at the federal level. I worked for Senator Patty Murray, who some of you are, are aware of, is uh, very involved in education policy. 
um, and then uh, was appointed by President Barack Obama to lead the tech and sort of innovation uh, team at the U.S. Department of Education. Um, we uh, was there. I was there for a while, and then worked also for uh, the state of Rhode Island as the chief innovation officer for uh, Governor Raimondo in Rhode Island. So that's kind of my background, and I'm thrilled now to be uh, at ISTE. I've been a member of ISTE for many years, and the goal of ISTE, the, 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 twit, the Twitter version of ISTE, if you're not familiar with our organization, is we look at how we can use technology to accelerate solving tough problems in education. Uh, we do that through a number of things like our ISTE standards, and we have states everywhere from Texas to New York that have adopted the ISTE standards, to uh, events that we host, to publications, to resources that we provide. Um, and all with the goal of saying, how do we help use tech to solve problems because it has such a strong uh, ability as an accelerator to help us do some things we weren't able to do before. So that's me. Glad to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Ellen Elia. Um, I'm a teacher. Um, I started teaching many years ago, taught for 19 years, and then moved into administration. I started that career with 17 years in New York State as a social studies teacher. And then I moved to Florida. And um, I was in Florida for 30 years, taught for a couple years, was in various jobs in a district there, large district, Hillsborough County, Tampa. And um, in that time period, um, we did a lot of training for teachers. We also did a lot to look at what should be happening in every classroom. And I would say to you that, um, the time that, that we spent supporting teachers and the appropriate use of technology in their classrooms really was time well spent. And we tried to make sure that we had, um, we had kind of the proselytizing teachers in every school share with their peers, and it made a huge difference for us. So um, just about three years ago, I had the opportunity to come back to New York, where I had been teaching, and I am now the Commissioner of Education in New York State. Um, an exciting place to be. Um, those of you, or anybody, is anybody here from New York? Okay, yeah. right. So I know some questions that are on your mind. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, this is an exciting time in New York. Um, one of the things, and I know Richard and Hugh are really familiar with this, we, um, in 2014, New York passed a $2 billion Smart Schools Bond Act. Ultimately, schools have access of, to that money um, to put together a plan so that they can put the kind of technology that needs to be in place, so the infrastructure, as well as devices, and supports for other things to support, ultimately, um, New York schools being smart. So that's the work that we've been doing. Um, we've also, just as most of you know, have submitted the ESSA plan to the federal government. And there's a number of key initiatives in that we think are very important and related to appropriate use of technology. And we also, um, within the last year, we did a review for almost a year and a half of standards and we adopted a new set of standards. So the New York State Next Generation Standards um, are part of our work now, too. So I think all of these things are, are really pulled together with the use of technology. But I would say, ultimately, that um, the teachers and the work that they do with technology to make it work for the student is the critical piece of this. So that sets the stage for where I'm coming from. OK, great. So uh, I, I guess, you know, actually, both of you mentioned standards. And that's as good a place as any to start with a topic as broad and wide as educational technology, right? Uh, but when we talk about standards uh, and, and when we talk about the, the rise of, uh, of technology applications and tools in, in K-12 in general, um, I think there's a general, there, there's, a, there's a sense at the, at the building level, at the classroom level, there's a little bit of uh, application fatigue, right? I think we've all seen plenty of applications. There's always something new. There's a, there's a fatigue of the new a little bit with regard to uh, technology as it, as it relates to education. And I think there's a, a, a sense that, um, that from on high, from a policy perspective, we, we, we keep thinking there's going to be a, a, a silver bullet, that there's going to be a technology app, there's going to be like 
the, the, the killer app is going to come along and reform uh, a lot of the problems that we see in education. I think you have already alluded to your stance on this by saying the teacher is at the center of this. But this question of, uh, of, of application proliferation, of, um, of technology inclusion in the classroom, and the growth of that uh, kind of um, begets this question of standardization. And it, it begets this question of how do you tie technology uh, um, uh, costs, expense, uh, implementation uh, uh, models, time and focus, how do you tie that to the results that you're looking for? Um, and I don't, it's a pretty wide ranging mm -hmm. area, but if we, if we start with this idea that you know, there's, a, there's a lot of technology out there. Maybe eight or 10 years ago, we thought of K-12 as a sector that was not particularly advanced technologically. I think that's probably faded right now, but I think we have the sense that there's a lot out there, but maybe it's not doing all that it could. So what, what do we see out there that we like? Uh, what do we see that, out there that should be um, kind of seen as standardized? Uh, and, and then what do we see as, as kind of the, the risks or the, the edges to that? Well, you know, I, I think one of the things that really gets, uh, um, gets related to that point that I made about teachers, um, I don't think that, that we are in a position to say, um, this is what we like and this is what we're going to do. because we are not the ones that are in those classrooms working and implementing. And um, if you, can, you can decide whatever program you want, but if it has a poor implementation, it isn't going to work. And we have to have something that, that is really generated by the interest, the need of the students in the classroom, and the needs of the schools um, right. to be able to connect and use the data. And all of that is going to be dependent on the buy-in that you have from teachers, and their involvement in the decision making. And I think that's an absolutely critical piece yep. that sometimes we forget about. Yep. Um, so you can dictate what, there's gonna, what programs you're gonna use, and as you pointed out earlier, uh, those programs are flipping all the time. And um, you've gotta get something that the teachers in particular settings want, and will use, and can use to support Right. Um, student learning. So I think that's a really critical piece. And also, I think the idea of, of finding out what gets outcomes with kids. So people have put together some great programs. I think um, sometimes if you're not in the classroom and you see them presented, you think, geez, this could be great. It could be great. It isn't if it isn't used properly, if it isn't implemented, and there isn't support with it. And so all of those pieces, I think, have to be part of it before you start moving forward on what you're going to put in every classroom in a school district or in a state. Right. So you had like about 30 questions in there. So yeah. I'm going to just pick yeah. a piece of that. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, one of the things I think is interesting is, I, I, let me say it this way. The worst conversations I have about using technology in education are ones that start with, hey, so we bought a bunch of these devices and, right? And sometimes it's not that obvious. Sometimes it's, hey, we want to use technology too. And those, usually when you start that way, it's kind of like just heading for a train wreck. The best conversations that I have about technology and education are one that start by saying, you know, we got a group of kids that aren't, they're struggling to read. We got a group of kids that are uh, just not feeling very engaged as we're teaching these math concepts here. We've got, right, those are, that gets really exciting because now we say, okay, cool, what do we do? Or, 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 you know, it's feeling like our learning experience is not adapting very well to the needs of individual students. Those are great technology conversations. The, hey, what do we do with technology? Bad. That's what we don't want to do. So I think that's the first part is we have to start with a vision for what does the learning look like? What learning experience do we want to have? And then the question is, how can technology support and accelerate it? So that's the first thing. We often say at ISTE, we say, Pedagogy first, technology second, or learning first, technology second, right? And, and I think that's key. But the second part of that ties to, to what you were saying is we, we love the fact that individual teachers and at the local level you get to choose what tools and apps you're using, of course. But what we don't do a good job of is helping them share that information. So at any given moment, there are thousands of teachers across the country evaluating what tool and app, maybe even the same tool and app, whether or not they should use it. And, and that's just a huge amount of wasted time. And so I think part of what we need to do uh, at, at a, you know, uh, sort of a, a national level or certainly at state level is to be able to say, can we create communities to share what you're finding out? Did you use a tool? Did it work? 
because the traditional approach of doing these long cycle evaluations on these, on these tools uh, just doesn't make sense in this current environment. And so as teachers are finding what's working, can they share with one another? Can we cut down that time so it's not so burdensome as they're trying to find tools that are aligning to their needs? So those are two things I think that we need to spend much more attention on as we talk about whether we're using technology in the right way. And in that way, really the teacher becomes the driver of um, what they're sharing mm -hmm. with their peers, um, how they're collaborating to make it better. Yeah. Um, and they can talk through that when they're in the process of planning for standards that, um, that are really critical to implement in a classroom. And I would also say the other piece that I think technology can really help with is expanding opportunities for students to have almost like an expansion of the teacher's time, even though you know, we'd all like to make our days longer than 24 hours, but not easy. Um, but technology can do that. And I think teachers see that use of technology in, in a very positive way. OK. Um, yeah, I, 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 I did have a ton of questions in there. I still have a ton of questions related to, uh, you know, that I, I, and I, I understand the, the, the value of the teacher as, uh, as a kind of uh, an indicator of the, the use of the, the right use of a technology of technology. It, from, from on high, it never works. Um, from from a, a, a perspective of we have this, now what do we do with it? It's not going to work either, right? So um, how, how is it? Uh, give me an optimal situation. How does it, how does it, how's it, how should it work? If we were to go forward, how would we see this kind of play out? Uh, how would an adoption happen? How would someone, how would a district procure uh, the right tool for the right resource at the right time? Let me give two quick ideas uh, and uh, uh, just to sort of see that. So I think, so we have two problems. One is um, we are not preparing teachers effectively to know how to make good decisions about technology use. We are just mm -hmm. not. And that starts with the teacher prep program. Teacher prep programs need help. They are not preparing teachers. We hear this, I hear this from schools and districts across the country every day. They're calling in and saying, what can you do? Because we're getting all these teacher and teacher prep programs that are not prepared to make good decisions about how to use technology. And so that's the first place where we have to start. And that's an area where actually state policy makes a big difference when we talk about right. what is it that you're teaching in those teacher prep programs. As an organization, we are always reaching out to teacher prep programs and helping to support. So that's the first thing. We have to start preparing teachers better. And it's not just saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a Google certified teacher or an Apple certified teacher, whatever. Like, uh, that's great. It's saying, how do you actually know what decisions, what questions you should be asking when you're deciding what tools to use. And that has to start long before they ever come to the classroom. So that's, that's part one. And then I'd say the second part is, as teachers are actually in the classroom, it gets back to this idea of wh how, how can we think about um, using uh, procurement tools, pr processes, to improve the types of decisions that are made. Now, I know I hear, I say the word procurement and I just like watch the neurotransmitter shutting off in your, your brains, right? Because you're like, no, please. But procurement is actually a really powerful tool. It's a powerful lever to make, to improve decisions if, if done right. And so for example, um, in any procurement process, how many, um, where along any state procurement or district procurement does it say something like, uh, is the tool that you're adopting uh, aligned to uh, what we know about solid learning science? Right? Is it based on, on educational research? Just start there. Probably none. And even if it was, what would you even then do to, to find out whether that worked or not, right? But could we create a model, a procurement model, using procurement tools to actually say, here's where you need to check it against. Does this actually line up with, with things that we know from research make a difference? And if it does, you can get an accelerated path through the procurement process. Use the goofy bureaucracy of the process as, a, as an incentive to actually choose better tools and apps. And that's a kind of a cool thing that I think we could spend a lot more time thinking about at this state and district level. I do think one of the, the other ways to make sure you're getting a product that has had um, some testing and, and, can get, and can show outcomes is to make sure that there is a neutral body that gives across the country. And I would say that, that this is a, a role that the Department of Education um, should be taking on and should be giving more research-based grants out to check on what is actually working mm -hmm. with specific groups of students. So yeah. every gap is not the right thing for every kid, for every school, and for the kind of collaboration that you want to create with teachers and among teachers. And I, I think that's a really positive thing. There are some um, kind of guidelines that you can look, and Richard, you mentioned them, but I think 
it's important for that to be an ongoing process because this stuff is changing all the time. Well, and I think that that's that's actually you know I I feel like that while that might be okay, I feel like you know the say the Department of Ed right or the the what works research or the what works clearinghouse or something like that. I mean, it feels like the applications just move so much faster than that. Yes. And there's there's a new application out there every month, and every time we come to this conference, I feel like there's 150 new products, and the ones I saw last year aren't there. Uh, and and I think I think teachers feel that same sense of uh, like churn and cycle. And I think the 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 question that that it raises for me is really the the implicit or intrinsic cost of our current model of deployment of educational technology mm -hmm. and its cost to school districts yeah. to to the the learning exercise. I mean, if, if I think about the, the focus time we lose, the, the money we lose, the, uh, the time we lose to, to vet, source, uh, the try something out, it doesn't work, try something else out, it doesn't work. Um, we, we're, we're, we're loath to, to use children as guinea pigs, which rightfully so. At the same time, we want to test and validate. So where is that, where's the right new normal? One piece of it, Sorry, I just sort of can't hold back from jumping in on this one because this is you, you brought up the Department of Ed and the Department of Ed's role. Uh, one of the things, uh, when I worked at the Department of Ed, there were a number of things that we were able to do as a, as a team there and I'm very proud of. One thing that I feel like we never were able to do was fix how we were looking at the evaluation process of tools and apps. And Jack Buckley, who I saw come in somewhere right there, sir, knows more about this than anybody probably in the, 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 this whole conference. Um, and probably in the world, is about how are we looking at research approaches that align with what we're measuring. Mm -hmm. And the problem that we had, the fundamental problem with the approach that the Department of Ed took, which by the way is also taken in other places, is we take these long, slow, multi-year random control tile studies and we would apply them to like a little app that was being built, right? And so I remember talking to an app developer once, I actually overheard a conversation, and they were like, yeah, you need to, you need to get, you know, endorsed by IES or whatever. I was like, great, how do we do it? And like, well, you do this four-year study, it'll cost you like about a million dollars. And they're like, I built the app for like a thousand bucks in my garage in like a day. How is it possible that your study is gonna you know, be orders of magnitude more money and time than it was to just, I'll just build you eight new apps. You just pick and maybe one of them will work, right? So we have to realize that we need new approaches for evaluation. We need new approaches, and they exist. There are lots of ways to do it and they involve new and, and different approaches. And it doesn't mean that we can always say, you know, a thousand percent sure, but we can at least get a better indication of confidence in whether something will work than like, oh, it's blue, I like things that are blue, let's go with that app, right? Like, which unfortunately is how a lot of app decisions are made currently. And so I think that's what we need to do is say, what amount of data can we help put in front of the decision makers that's reasonable in the amount of time that they have and is not, doesn't take, you know, eight years, and the app, you know, if you do the two-year random control style, even if you did it, the app doesn't even exist anymore because it's morphed into eight new things. So that's something we're just going to have to come to, gra gra you know, uh, grips with as an education community is that we have to think about how we evaluate those apps in very different ways. Right, but every time that's ex that is put into a school, into a classroom, then you get to the implementation of it, then you get to the time spent for the teacher to to become familiar with it, to get the kids familiar with it, to start working through it, then to realize, okay, what's happening here, and then to start working with all of her peers or his peers in the school. Those things also take a lot of time. Yes. And yes. every time you put something new into a classroom, that takes time to do a good implementation of it. And so this p push to get lots of things in, try different things, is a problem. We've got to figure out a better way to do that. We, we also, by the way, uh, that's a great point, and I just want to—I want to double click on that for a second. We also do a terrible job of deciding what to stop doing. Yeah. Right. We're like, let's do more. I sometimes I joke about my dad has um, in his closet. This is sounds weird, but hang with me for a second. In my dad's closet, he has a certain number of hangers, and he has never, since I was born, he has never added a hanger to his closet. And his rule is, if you give him a shirt, if you give him a pair of pants for Christmas, whatever it is. He looks at his closet and he decides one and he takes it out and he gives it away and he puts it back on the hanger. So he has limited number of clothes in his hanger, right? In school, we just like keep shoving more hangers in and shoving like maybe we could pack eight more pieces of clothes on this one hanger right. and it's overwhelming. And so as much as we want to think about adding new, we also just have to be thoughtful about what can right. we stop doing? And we, and we can't always just be adding. And that's hard, but, but it's something we need to do. Well, I, I think that we get, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a certain ease uh, th th that comes with the familiar, 
right? Whether it works or not is kind of a secondary question sometimes. Yeah. Uh, it, it's easy. Sure, 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 wait a minute. So on that, let's, on that, go into any class somewhere and say, how many of you believe in learning styles? Bam, all the hands go up, right? It's totally false, it's ridiculous. It's been disproved like a bazillion times mm -hmm. over, but it's comfortable and it's familiar, right? Right, right, right. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a pedagogy construct that doesn't necessarily work, but imagine an app application or, or an LMS or something that's just, it's there, it doesn't necessarily, it kind of clunks along at 25 miles an hour, right? There's something that could go faster, there's something that could do better, but the, the cost of implementation, the cost of uh, retraining, the cost of installation, the cost of rip and replace are really significant yeah. and, they're, and they're meaningful. And I think for, for uh, public ed, there's this, you know, I, I, I do feel like there's almost like a, a, it's heretical for someone like me to say, but it would be interesting to see like a one year moratorium on anything new, but ev give everybody an opportunity to evaluate what they actually like, what they want to keep in the closet, and what they want to give away or move well, out. Well, what they have in their right. using, right? Right. We don't give it enough time sometimes right. to really get an implementation embedded into the reality of the situation. And therefore, you flip, right? right. More often than you need to. Yeah. And I think that's the big issue. And so, um, so the time is a critical piece. The support for teachers, for students to understand how it, how it all works, and they're all at different at different places when they walk in that classroom, and so you've got to work that. And I right. think those are the kinds of things that uh, everybody who's designing and putting in place all of these new options out in this marketplace, they're thinking, okay, well, this is better than we had here. This is better than here. But every time you do that, you are taking a lot of time and you're putting emphasis on something that's new when in fact you haven't really gotten to the whole implementation of what you had. So I think that slowing down is something that at least has to be done at the school level, right. the district level, um, where decisions like that are made and procurement is a big issue in that. Right. I think there's another reason for the flip too, which is it's easier and it's not e easy to do, but it's easier to adopt a new tool than often to improve a tool that you already have existing. Yeah. So just out of curiosity, how many of you in the room are represent a tool, are, are a vendor-based tool, whether you're a vendor or represent, okay, so you have a number of tool providers in the room, whatever we wanna call it, right? Um, it is very difficult in many ways to take feedback from what's happening in schools and actually use that to improve products. Right. It, it, is, it is like having been on, on, on both sides, right? The companies are really frustrated because like, well, you complain about our tool all you want, but nobody told us that it needed to be fixed and teachers are like, oh, this is garbage. All I need is this button to be moved over here and nobody will do it, right? And so there's this lack of like, it, it's like, it's like the cycle goes here and just sort of stops like, and we need to, we need to be able to have this cycle keep iterating and, and improving. So it's not that you have to constantly be adopting new stuff, but it can be that things right. are adapting and improving as, as time goes on. Uh, we need many more areas, more forums to be able to do that. And we, but we've got to be careful because we know that there are some times where it can be, uh, you, you, there, are, there are conflict of interest questions, right? You know, when you, when you come in and, and uh, you know, companies, you know, paying teachers to endorse their product or do, that gets a little scary. And so we have to be able to say, how do we get, that, how do we get those feedback loops happening, but in ways that are, are not inappropriate for established uh, conflict of interest rules? Well, it's almost like being a partner with a developer, right? right? Where, the, where there's a constant feedback, focus groups occur, teachers who want to give feedback say, I know you could fix this easily and here's how you can do it, that's what would help us more. I think those are the kinds of things that have to be built into a process. I was talking to a, t uh, a school leader, I think from your state actually, uh, recently who said, we don't work with uh, vendors anymore. I said, really? <laughs> nope, don't anymore. I was like, oh, that's interesting. How, how do you, what do you do? And they say, we only work with commercial partners. I was like, that's interesting, right? I mean, it really is. It's not just a word change. They were really serious about it. We don't, if you're just going to sell us something, we're not interested. If you're interested in working with us to co-build something, now we're interested. And I was like, it, it's just, it's a shift in the way we think about it. It's not just buy something off the shelf. It's build together something that works for both of us. And, and that is a process that gives respect mm -hmm. to the people that are part of the process to implement. Yeah, right. And then you have more of a buy-in because people are willing to listen when you have something you're working with with students and you find you really could get a lot more out of it if, and then that if is what helps. Right, so there's a, there's a really good question that kind of pertains to this area, it's right at the top here for us. It's, 
does the abundance of idiosyncratic tools and profound lack of integration interoperability constitute a market failure, implying the need for a quote-unquote mm. public good? Hmm. Well, first of all, I love the word. <laughs> right? So those, those are I'm really looking them up right now. Hang some, on. Okay. Some very, right. very higher ed. Yeah. Um, and so I would say for sure the integration and interoperability, that's a huge issue, right? So you have things that aren't necessarily connected to the, the work that's being done in a classroom because a lot of people aren't in classrooms all the time, right? The teachers are, but a lot of the people developing aren't there. They aren't, right. they aren't really focused on that. And it's not an integrated thing unless there's been a great implementation that brings in, in teachers ahead of time, working with students, we did some implementations in summer school that helped us to get things done. Mm -hmm. And when you had smaller groups of kids, you could pretty much target the work. And right. I think that's one of the things, the whole concept of not being integrated into what's actually happening. And for us in New York, I mean, we're doing these new standards implementation. It's going to last for like two, two and a half years. Um, that work has to have the pedagogy of, of technology being part of it. Um, but I like to think that, that for teachers, um, the technology becomes like a pen, a pencil, the approach they take to really um, facilitate learning in their classroom. I, I would love to think that too. I think the reality is it, it, does, it feels like a pencil that just doesn't write. Uh, I, well, I think, the, then you have a bigger problem. Yeah, I, I really do, because I, I feel like, you know, for, uh, for, from what I've seen when I go visit classrooms or when we do conduct focus groups, and we do a lot of that work for uh, our state groups and our, our large urbans that we work with, and we don't really, we've gotten away from developing standalone products, quite honestly, because mm -hmm. I think there is a sense that we don't work with vendors anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to work with, you know, commercial off-the-shelf type stuff, or they're going to work on things that are partnership-based that lead them where they want to go, right, and, and, and speak specifically to their local needs. But at the same time, it feels like every time I'm in the, those classrooms, there's always five new applications, and it's five new navigation environments, and it's five new user inter interfaces, and it's potentially five passwords and, and 35 password recoveries for that, for that teacher to work with. And that's the, that's the life of that teacher. So when, you know, we w I think we all want technology to be as ubiquitous as a pencil, as interoperable as a pencil or a pen. I think that's the, that's the goal, but I think that we're, we're a little jammed up at the moment. And I think it is, you know, somewhat related to these, um, you know, kind of the familiarity of the process, the familiarity of what exists, right? The, the, the inability to innovate uh, incrementally without just replacing yeah. the whole, you know, where it becomes easier to just find a new tool than it is to, yeah. it, to, to incrementally in, uh, innovate. Um, and then I think I think that uh, there is to, to this to this question of, of you know is there market failure? I think the lack of interoperability from a technical perspective is a problem, and mm -hmm. it's a growing problem because I think it does it, it means that there's there are borders where there don't need to be in public education. Right. I, I think there may I, I maybe have a slightly more glasses half full view of it, <laughs> but I do recognize that this is an issue. And I don't disagree. But what I would say is I am supposed to what, what I that. hear is when I when I when I walk around and say, God, this isn't working anywhere, right? I can give you tons of examples where it's working beautifully. Right. And so what's the difference? And I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that we have certain schools, districts, whatever level they're making these decisions, that are asking questions that others are not, right? And so I go into some school districts, I say, hey, how do you make the choice about what you're... Uh, uh, what you're going to be using, and their answer is, you know, if it doesn't, if single sign-on isn't supported, we don't use it. Guys, if any of you are adopting apps that don't support single sign-on, you're crazy. Stop doing that. Like, the reason there are tools that are still made that don't support single sign-on is because we're buying them, <laughs> right? So, like, that's how we see And so when you go into districts that recognize that, it's a very different experience. There are also tools, I don't know how many of you have heard of this, uh, there's an initiative called Project Unicorn. That's a, 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 an interesting project, you hear some head nods, some interesting work around syncing up data. And we have schools that are saying, we do not play in the sandbox with, with tools and apps that aren't compliant with some of these interoperability features. And so I think what we have to do a little bit is, I, I, I think it's almost more of a 
scale problem than it is an infrastructure problem. There are some infrastructure pieces we could improve on, but there are places where it's working well, and what shocks me is I like go to one school and they're like, yeah, single sign-on, we have data interoperability, we have some dashboards that sit on top of this stuff, we know how to hot swap tools in and out, and we don't lose all of our data, great. And then I like walk across the street. Right. It's like we have 37 logins right. and all the lo right. and all that right. stuff that you That's said. Exactly. And it. so why why is it that you are like sitting right next to each other? You're right next door to each other, and you have some that work really well and some that don't. Some of that I think probably could be uh, you know there are things that I think at the state level we uh, there's an ability to, to help improve. I also think it's on folks like us at ISTE to do a better job of highlighting the things that are working well and saying this is what it's supposed to look like. We do a series of awards, we could probably do more of that. It's also about creating communities that cross schools. So little communication actually happens outside of your individual school. And so building online networks and communities just to share what's working I think is, is, is helpful. But that idea of taking where it works and, and being able to scale it more broadly I think is really the, the tough issue here. Well I think it happens outside. I mean, there is, within a district for instance, mm -hmm. you would have a lot of sharing. Sure. Okay. You're in a right. large district. Yeah. So in my Florida experience, there's 67 districts for the whole state. Now I'm in New York, there's 741. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, you can do it within your district in New York, but it just doesn't have the, um, the scale up, if you will, to get to where you need to be because mm -hmm. the districts themselves are small. Now there's ways to get through that. We have BOCES and other groups that help to make those things smoother. And so is that decrease the lines, but it that is a really that is, is a big issue. Is, is that a is that a is that a, a public policy uh, need, or is that a is that a, a, a networking and organizational associational need? What, like who who helps solve that? Well, I do think it, part of this is, as Richard said, it's getting um, information to the determiners of the process for selection that say. Here are things that just should be the baseline, right? So you aren't going to have all these different ways to get into this software. You're going to be able to have a single sign-on, and that's it. Right. And that's a really critical piece. And telling people that who haven't been involved in it but need to know that so that they don't yeah. put in place something that is virtually impossible to implement, then I think those are the kinds of things that, um, that states certainly can work on and make sure that that becomes a standard across the state. But you know, we're in the, we are in the world right now of local control, and I'm, I constantly yeah. urge schools and districts, go to their teachers, find out from the teachers what they need to support them. And if they have ideas on things they wanna see, bring in those things and have them have exposure to it. Yeah. to decide if that's going to work for them. Well, I, I do think that uh, Richard's example of, like, you know, talking to the, to the, to the uh, administrative uh, team at, around a conference table and you hear single sign-on and hot swapping, et cetera, then you walk across the street to Building A and there's 37 yeah. new logins. That is, a, that is a factor, frankly, of, of, of lack of communication up, right? Mm -hmm. An inability to hear what the teachers need and what they, what they uh, yeah. are requiring of, of the district, right? Right. Um, that, and that, that is a, you know, that, Hopefully that's a that's a, a standard of operating that gets addressed by a um, kind of more communication, more sharing, more best practice uh, uh, awareness, et cetera. Um, so uh, real quick, we're getting a um, that top question. Yeah, and we yeah, got to talk yeah, about that yeah, one. Yeah, we got to we got to go there. Which is uh, um, th this was the uh, um, where to go? Oh, um, oh, it just moved. Yeah. <laughs> Wait stop, a minute. Stop voting. Stop voting up. <laughs> Technology. I think it was. I think it was. Uh, I agree that we need new ways of evaluation yeah, methods. Do you have examples of these new methods? So, so the answer is yes. There are new methods, and I'm going to do something that may be a little weird. So, Joseph South, raise your hand. Jack Buckley, raise your hand. Darren Cambridge, raise your hand. These are like the three smartest people that I know in this space, and they're sitting in this room. So, I'm going to give a kind of lame answer to get things started, and then afterwards, you should talk to them because they will tell you much more about it. But there are lots of ways to do this. There are one of the easiest things that we can do, and, and these are not, this is not like super high-end gold standard research, but it is data that helps with evaluation. So one of the things is that a lot of tools and apps simply have data that becomes available. We can look at are students actually engaging and completing and using the tools in ways that they were intended. 
right? Like, simple as that. Like, is that actually helpful, right? So that's one. Another thing that we can do, and this is the, the um, uh, demo that uh, Mindy just did across the hall here, is something that we call um, uh, EdTech Advisor, which is something that ISTE provides, which is a tool where we ask teachers, to, all the tools that they're using, talk about what you're finding that's working. It's observational data, right? It's not a random control trial, but they say, hey, this doesn't work, or this is great, but only if you have time to sit down and do it with the students, right? Just that level of data is a huge improvement over like a five-star rating. Oh, and one more, let me throw one more in, which is just providing some context around the rating. So sure, do your one to five star, but in the one to five star, let's say who it was that did that one to five star. Is it a, because you, you know, the problem that you have is you have, if you have a tool and it's like a three star and you're like, oh, it's a mediocre tool. Maybe it's not a mediocre, maybe it's a phenomenally awesome five star tool if you're a, you know, 12th grade English teacher, but it's like a one star if you are a you know, fifth grade teacher with high ELL population. But on a normal rating without context, it just shows up as a three star. And so those are a couple things right off the bat that we could do that would not cost a lot of money and would make a huge difference. And you talk to those three and they'll give you even better ideas. So I think that whole issue of making sure that something is reflective of the students you're using it for is critical. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, you know, if you have ELL students in your classrooms and in your school and you aren't taking into account that as you're making determinations about software and there's no capability to have translations with it, I mean, please, right. Right. you know, those are not right. things that should be done, but often just because of a poor process, they get selected. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, and I'll, we'll answer this one real quick because it's getting a lot of votes, but uh, I, I feel like it's uh, um, leading us down the, a, a bad path. It's the glass half empty. <laughs> oh, which one's which is, about? Who do you feel is ultimately oh, yeah. responsible for the success or failure of an ed tech product? Tech implementation staff, teachers, or developers? Yes. <laughs> that was my answer, actually, too. <laughs> Next. <laughs> seriously, okay. seriously, yeah. but yes and not in isolation. So, yeah. so yes, and mm -hmm. you're all, y'all, we all get thrown under the bus if we're, if right. we're not talking to each other and collaborating right. with each other. It's gotta be everybody. It's not something that one person can do. But, but, but there are key pieces that each have to do. And if you have any one of those missing in there, then it's gonna go off the rails. Well, that's why, the, that's why development really needs to include the same people that we're talking about there. Right. So staff, teachers, all of them need to be working with developers. So a partnership's a really great yeah. way to do this. Yeah, yeah. But by the way, one thing, I, I, I'm sort of being careful because I don't want to just sort of focus on, on what, what ISTE does, but there is one thing that may be useful to know, which is we actually provide a service. If you have a product that you need feedback on, that you want input for teachers on, you can come to ISTE, and we have a network of 200,000 educators, and you can say, we want you know, 20 uh, high school math teachers to give us feedback on this particular module. It's not for sales. We don't allow it. It's not a sneaky way to, it's, it's actually for feedback. We push that out to them, we collect that feedback, and then we bring it back to the developer, all with the intent of improving the, the, the so quality the of that So the developer product. asks you for that. Correct. So the developers are, they give us the questions, we do it, we check to make sure it's, again, not, you know, something that's not supposed to be. It's truly getting feedback, and then we compile it and give it back. And the idea is to try to get that cycle going so we actually yep. get some feedback back on some of these things. Okay, um, before we go back to a couple of these uh, audience questions, though, I want to I um, uh, kind of raise the, 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 um, the, the challenge of um, kind of the educational technology as, uh, as a disruptor and as the, the pencil, right, the ubiquitous resource, right? So think about things like uh, AR and, uh, and, and VR and um, uh, personalized learning to a max level, so to speak, and uh, gamification and those kinds of things in the context of you know, all the other technology that's out there that is, you know, uh, where we're, we're talking about interoperability and, uh, and, and incremental innovation. So, you know, uh, learning management systems and OER and uh, um, kind of, you know, uh, uh, assessment tracking, things like that. Where, where, do we see, um, where do we see the promise of ed tech? Uh, in, you know, in the next couple of years or, or even, you know, farther into the future? Where, where, where is that promise? Is the, is the promise in um, kind of a, a ubiquity and a sameness with, uh, with, the, with, with the, the tools being like a pencil for the teacher? Or are we looking at kind of disruptive change in public education long term? I know that's, a, that's one of those sci-fi type questions, right? You know, do, do we have a, do we have a classroom? Do we question. have classrooms with 20 teachers in 10 years? Or do we have, you know, kids at home being taught by Watson, right? Well, 
So there's lots of different ways to look at, and I think you have to look at the scenarios that you're particularly addressing. So if you're in um, a very, very rural district, technology can do some incredible things for kids that they'd never have available. And so I think that has to be one of the things. We've included that in that work in our um, ESSA plan. Um, we're putting emphasis on higher level um, coursework that's available, and we don't have it available everywhere. There are not colleges and universities in every part of New York, but we do have the availability of online learning and accessing coursework that way. So I think you have to look at the situation. Um, can te technology really disrupt and, and expand options for kids? Absolutely. Um, should it be doing that? Yes. We should make that available, and that gets to the issue of equity. Because if you don't have that, then it's not a fair system. Right. And it's, it's really important to be thinking about it that way. But also, the reality is, how do you make those things happen and still make it available for kids to have the one-on-one -on -one with the teacher, the importance of teachers in every classroom? All of that's a really critical piece. So, you know, I think there's a potential in many different scenarios to really disrupt. And I think there's a potential for the use of technology in classrooms that is integrated in the work that's being done there and part of the delivery of instruction that really enhances it. Yes, thank you for bringing up the equity point. We have not talked about that much yeah. yet and I think that's critical, yeah. so I, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I would say th there are sort of two futures, if we sort of paint the future of this, there's two futures. Neither one of them doesn't have tech involved. That's where that train's left the station. <laughs> like if we're still on that, well, will there be tech? No, no we're done with that. There will either be, there will be tech in, in both situations. In one scenario, we will have technology that is used to essentially duplicate what we've traditionally done, right? We deliver content in front of the room, instead of delivering content in front of the room, we'll deliver content on an app. You know, we, you know, we call them nexters, right? You're like next, 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 and then at the end you pick the question that has the most words in it and you get a little certificate that says you've learned something, right? That is duplicating traditional practice, it is saying, you know, we log in online into some like LMS tool and there's a teacher that controls all of the options right. and the right. students that all they can do is sit there and post questions, just like we did in the class. We replicated those weird lockdown roles from the classroom in a digital space. That's one world. The other world is a world where we use technology in a way that transforms learning. Where learning is not used to present, the technology is not used to present content. That's like the least interesting way to use technology. Technology is used as a tool to design and create and build and problem solve. When I, I talk about kids, I, I was visiting a school in uh, um, Tucson and, and they, we had these kids that were outside of their class, which by the way, first of all, I was like, what are you doing out of here? I, you know, they're messing around while they're supposed to be in class. And they're like, no, no, we're in our class. We're in our biotech class. And what we're doing is we're taking samples of the plant life around the outside of the school. And they had a device, they're using this device to collaborate with researchers at a university. And they were creating a genome structure of the a genomic structure of the plant indigenous plant life around their school that they were then going to publish in a, a research journal before they graduated from high school, right? Like this is the awesome stuff. They were not sitting there going, plant, what is the DNA structure of a plant? Next, what does it look like? Next, ah, they're using it as a tool to create and design and build. And that's a, a it's a both are very real possibilities. One is a possibility that we're doing everything we've always been doing now, but just on a screen. And the other is a possibility where it looks very different and it's very much used as tools to enable students. But it comes down to the choices that we make like literally this year. Over the next year or two, I think is right when we're gonna see the tipping point of what happens. Why, why do you think this next year or two? Because this is, the first, this is the first year that we've really had ubiquitous connectivity in schools across the country. Some states have been a little bit ahead of that, uh, as, as is, is the case here, but, but it's the first time, so when we, um, Five years ago, we had about 20% of schools that had access to high-speed broadband. When we came in to, to the Department of Ed, which I couldn't believe. This is not like 10 years ago. Five years ago, there was better connectivity at your local Starbucks than there was at any school that you could walk into the country. And through some big changes that happened under the Obama administration and new programs were put in place, as of last year, we had 96% of schools that were connected to broadband. Now, is there still more work that can be done? Of yeah. course there is. Yes, there is but we finally have a situation where we can actually begin to use technology at scale. And so all these decisions are starting to be made about which tools are gonna to be used and how they're gonna be used, and those decisions are being made over this year and next. And in those t transitions, we're either going to make decisions that really transform how we think about learning, 
or we're going to decide on stuff that replicate traditional practice. And if we go with the latter, it will be very hard to, to transform out of that down the road. Right. Okay. Okay. So there's a question here, which is, I, I, I should know never to put, never to write a, a description of a session that has a question in it. It'll come right back at us. <laughs> so is tech and ed always a good thing? Uh, I think you kind of answered that in, in that yeah. it just is, right? There, there's no not tech. It's right. like, is right. tech in my life a good thing, right? Is well, like tech wait. and driving a good thing? Like there is no car right now that is not a driving computer. Like it, it just, it is. Well, there's so I think some the uses question of is technology how do you... in the classrooms that I would say are not productive. Sure. Okay, right. and those are things that I think we just have to accept that's not the good use of technology. Right. Right. And it isn't extending learning for kids and it is taking something and making, enforcing it to be in a technology environment right. that isn't really maybe the best but place. This for is it. the awesome question. Like, let's, can we edit that question? The question is, sorry, forever post that. The question is, <laughs> you don't get are we question. using, why not? Because the app won't support editing. We need the developer in here to yeah. fix this. No, I'm just kidding. So, so the question that we're hearing though is, are we using tech in the right way? That's the question. And it's different than is tech and ed a good thing. It, 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 it's an is, right? It's like right. saying is, is electricity in the, in the classroom like a good thing? It, we're not taking electricity back. What we're saying is can we make sure we're using it in the appropriate ways? Tech is an accelerator. It will accelerate whatever you apply it to. If you apply it to bad, ineffective practices, you get faster, bad, ineffective practices. If you apply it to good, high-quality teaching practices, you get faster, higher quality teaching practices. And so that's the question that we right. really need to ask. So right? there, is, there, there is though, uh, uh, and I, I think uh, just yesterday, the, it was the Center for Humane Technology, which is mm -hmm. the, uh, the folks out of Google and Twitter and Facebook who are kind of coming together around this with common sense media. And the argument being made there is that, that in certain cases, in certain ways, uh, um, in encouraging or enforcing students to, to and children to uh, use and interact with technology, we are essentially trading away their attention, right? There's this idea that, uh, that, that these, these large companies are not actually in it for the student's good, that they're in it for the attention of the student mm -hmm. down the road, uh, and that therefore it may not, in fact, be, even though the, the tool itself feels good, looks good, teachers want to use it, the teachers, and, th and there's a sense that we always want to engage the student where they are, right? Uh, so, do you, you have thoughts on that? Do you want to well, comment so on that? I, so, I, I certainly think that, this, that there has to be um, confines on what you're trying to do with technology, that everything about technology and all uses of technology are good things. Um, the reality is that it sometimes does distract students from thinking about what you want them to think about. And it gives them options of that that perhaps they aren't ready for. Right. And so I, I think there's part of technology and the use of technology, whether it's in education or in life, that have to be, um, have to be talked about and have to be given guidelines. And we have to work with students so they understand um, how to check resources on Google. Right, right, right. So right. that everything on there is not absolute truth. This is Those the are all things of like, yeah, approach, it's, yeah, it's like that's how we have to be about technology. All of it, all the time, is not always good. And I think that's the, the question that you get to. And right. at what age is it appropriate, right? And so, um, so when, when students are high school seniors, and they're going to be going out into a, a college, university, a job, they're going to be using technology in some context. That's a different thing than if you're starting with um, first and second graders and you're using technology all the time for some of those examples that you talked about at the beginning, Richard, mm -hmm. where kids are just put on this and, the, and it's taking the place of a teacher without right. much right. Um, right. intervention. So I, I think all of those things are appropriate to be looking at. We've got to make sure that we also have this, um, this conversation and being good consumers and um, helping having technology be helpful in your life instead of a consumption of right, your life. Right. The, the, I agree completely. The only thing I would add is just a way to, is just a, a, an emphasis on, on, on what you just said. When we wrote the National Ed Tech Plan, uh, one of the things that we, we sort of coined, we coined a new term, which was the digital use divide. 
And what we're trying to say is that for years we've been talking about closing the digital divide, closing the digital, make sure that people have access to technology. And largely that divide is, is getting closed. Again, yes, do we still have kids that are sitting in a parking lot trying to get their school Wi-Fi because they don't have it at home? Yes, do we need to care about that? We do. But largely we're making huge progress on closing the traditional digital divide. And what we were flagging was there's a new digital divide, which we call the digital use divide, which was the difference between using this tool as a tool to you know, create, explore, all these words we've been talking about, or as a passive consumption tool. Yeah. Yep. And what we're yep. seeing is that's the new digital divide. And unfortunately, the students that are using it as a you know, mobile TV tend to be the lower socioeconomic students, the ones that are in poorer schools and less research schools and schools with lower quality teachers. And that's a hard reality. And so part of what we need to do is say, as we shift away from being so worried about the digital divide, we need to think more about the digital use divide and make sure we're using these tools in the way we want them to be used and not just as passive you know, device content distributors. Right. Okay, we have a couple minutes left and we have a bunch of questions, so maybe we can go uh, do a little rapid fire here and see what we can come up with. Uh, from a job seeker who wants to help teacher preparation programs, which programs do you think are doing exciting work, university and or non-conventional, which I, I, you know, takes me to alt, alt cert. Well, I will say in New York, we just uh, adopted new standards for um, teacher preparation programs. And, um, and one of the standards is the use of technology in appropriate ways in classrooms and then the expansion beyond that. Yeah. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I, you know, there's no university that I can actually mention on that. But I know that in New York, it's, it's being really infused across the board, yeah. SUNY, CUNY, and the yeah. independents. I struggle to think of a single example. Sorry, this is, I, as I mentioned, I'm usually the glasses half full guy. This is one where I'm just yeah, like. Yeah, well, I, I, I come out of higher ed and, and, and specifically teacher prep and uh, I, I sit on the board at NCTQ and we work on uh, this question all the time. I, I have to say it's a, it's a disappointing and discouraging answer there for, uh, from us, I think. Yeah, so, so, so whoever that is. Not, we're right, not, I, right, I'm, right. I'm saying that very and I think clearly. Those are, I think that's a huge step in the right direction because if yeah. state policy can, can enforce some level of change and, and, and movement in teacher preparation programs, it's great. But teacher prep programs are kind of hard. So whoever that is, go pick a school <laughs> and go make a dang difference go, there go because you could almost flip a coin and just pick any one and, and that work needs to be done and right. just, just really try to push that forward. By the way, was that you that posted that question? Yeah, let's talk afterwards about some opportunities there. Uh, let's see, what are your thoughts on improving training for teachers and professors on all of this expensive technology? It's not, it, it kind of similar. Only the expensive technology, not the inexpensive. <laughs> right. I'm sorry. This, um, this is rapid fire. Uh, I think there are um, a, a lot of ways that it can be done that is not incredibly painful. One is to just start to in, get involved with communities that are already talking about this work. There are a whole bunch of Every state has like a, uh, has ed chats where they talk about this. We have communities that we host at ISTE. There are lots of places that you can go to do that, but it does require some incentives on the part of the school, and in some cases the state, as you guys have shown. Yeah, and I, I, but I, I will say this. Um, so what comes to us often is that the professors that are in these programs are not really in touch with the realities yeah, of what's happening in schools, in say. classrooms, and and so that's another part of kind of um, the implementation of a quality teacher prep program, leadership prep program, is making sure that the professors that are teaching are connected. This is perfect. Here's yeah. the answer. Here's what we need to do. We need to pass a law that no teacher can teach in a teacher prep program if they haven't taught in the classroom at least once in the last five years. There you go. It's not a law. It just could be a regulation. Could be a regulation. It doesn't need to be a law. <laughs> Spoken as Thank you. Spoken as a commissioner. I know they're a little harder. Yeah, yeah a, little, a little dangerous. Reg. That's it. That's what we need to do. Okay. Do you see opportunities for partnership between public, private, charters, et cetera, schools? How can so many different schools work together to meet student needs? I think that the, the, the question, the, the answer that comes to mind on this one for me is uh, uh, data and, and uh, technology interoperability uh, and standardization. Um, this is, I, I think it's one of the fundamental precepts for improving uh, technology and education in K-12 is the idea that we can and should, as producers of technology, be relying on standardization wherever possible, and we should be moving towards standardization wherever possible because it makes buying decisions easier, it makes assessment and research easier, and it makes development easier. So it, it's a win-win for everybody and it's good for kids. Yeah. Uh, let's see, last, last question I think is we're, we're out of time. 
Uh, beyond access, how do we ensure there's equity for all students and teachers to quality education, technology, learning, and resources? And this is, this is the, the, the question of, of the, the new digital divide. It's not access it now. It's um, the methods of consumption yep. and the meta-knowledge of how to learn. Right? Well, I mean, I, I don't want to just slide yeah. by that there's yeah. no a issues yeah, with no, access. Right. I mean, Fair enough. I think there clearly are issues with access. We have uh, very different types of schools coming from very different zip codes across New York State. Um, how much, how much um, technology is available in their home? How much is not? Um, right. How do we access and make sure that uh, libraries across our country have access to the, the connected tools so that kids can be in school, have them outside in places where they can access them. Right. And I, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, right now we have kids and families that are in the parking lot outside of libraries in New York State because there is connective, right. connectivity there. Right. And so they're out sitting in their cars. So that whole issue doesn't really go away. It's right. got to be thought about. And that actually is, I think, a national agenda that needs to be put in place. Um, I know that President Obama had um, that going. We don't have that on the agenda right now, but I think it's a really critical piece. And if not from a national perspective, at least from a state perspective. I okay. totally agree. One second on this question. I know we're out of time, but on this one, <laughs> one of the things we just need to say is um, we do not look at tech as a tool for closing equity gaps, and that has to change. I believe it's the most powerful tool that we have to close long-standing existing equity gaps that we've looked at and stared at and pondered over for far too long without doing anything about it. And this is a tool that can be used to solve that in some very, very powerful ways. Well, thank you guys for coming and uh, listening, and thanks for participating. Appreciate it. Thank you it. all. <laughs>